Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Amanda. Um, where to from here? I think the critical question that always annoys me when I hit budgets is um, whether they're really that important or not. Um, and as an economist, I will tell you openly, budgets are way more a political statement than they are ever an economic statement. Uh, and so this, you've got in front of you an economist talking to you, making commentary about a political statement, which is a bit scary. Um, so I do need to put my prejudices in front of you so you know where I'm coming from. Um, as an economist and as a business person, I put myself on the progressive wing of thought. And by progressive, I mean I am one of the economists that acknowledge acknowledges the failure of markets to function. They have not delivered, and uh, when I learnt my economics a good few decades ago, I was taught about how markets don't function and how governments have a role to play. Um, that's not what, that is not what is taught now, but I still hold to that in terms of my economic beliefs. So I'm on the progressive wing of thought, uh, but having said that, because I've got to make a political statement essentially, um, I won't tell you who I have voted for in the past, but I did not vote for this government, and I haven't voted for any of the major political parties in the New Zealand spectrum for quite a long time. So I'll leave you to do that, uh, to figure out where I do sit. The political imperative, and I'll go to the economic, uh, go back to Nick's uh, economic context in a second, but the political imperative out there from my perspective is that we were promised a government of change and we were promised a government of transformation. And the big question is whether this government uses the age old excuse of we can't afford it to postpone that change and that transformation, which in my opinion is long overdue from an economic perspective, let alone all those other dimensions. Um, why this announcement next week is even more important from a political perspective is the last few months have seen what I would see as um, many issues that have signalled things going on the back burner in terms of transformation or in terms of change. Um, whether you talk about things that have been put off the agenda or put it, talk about things that have been delayed, deferred or um, put on the shelf. Uh, whether it be capital gains tax, whether it be issues around Kiwi Build, whether there's the teachers pay strike, it's pay or issue and or strike, um, the response to the welfare group report, uh, and uh, I was on that group, so I won't talk too much about that, but it goes in this context. The zero carbon bill, not quite as transformative as some would hope, but reasonably, you know, I'm not, I will acknowledge there's been huge steps forward in some of these issues, but not quite as much as we were promised. And then uh, similarly, cannabis referendum. Um, again, a few, I suppose, concerns about just how far forward transformationally this government is going to go. Uh, so I think this um, next week's announcements is almost the last throw of the dice in terms of this government about whether the next 18 months is going to be transformational as promised or whether it's going to be more a business as usual. So are we really going to see a wellbeing budget or is it going to be a business as usual with a glossy cover? And I think that's the, that's the issue that, and that's what I'll be looking at. Um, the understanding of wellbeing is, dare I say, a little bit muddled. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a fan of the Treasury version of well-being or the Treasury perspective on well-being. I will be honest in saying I applaud their ability to now spell the word, which is a huge step forward. I will applaud their, um, their uh, acknowledgement that we are now allowed to use that word in economic documents, which is also a huge step forward, uh, but there's a long way to go. Um, from the economic perspective, yes, the outlook is grim, and yes, it's coming from offshore, but the outlook's always been grim for New Zealand. Um, 
basically from the, the reason why the budget is even more important next week is because of the current situation in the economic cycle. I want to get too technical, but the last 30 odd years we have been told that monetary policy, that is interest rates going up or down, is the way we control or manage an economy. Well, the last five years should tell economists, let alone everybody else, that monetary policy is now redundant. It's actually impotent now. We've got monetary policy, we've got the official cash rate at the lowest it can possibly be, well, fairly close to, 1.5%, which effectively is pretty close to zero. Here in New Zealand and around the world, it is zero in some parts. So monetary policy is now despite the textbook that most of us and most economists current day learnt, is now not useful anymore in terms of managing the cycle. And if we've got a whole lot of shocks, what, e what economists call shocks, hitting the economy, then there's one other tool left in the basket. It's called fiscal policy. And for those who don't know what fiscal policy means, it's basically government taxing and spending. That's fiscal policy. The last 30 years we were told governments didn't have a role to play. Well, now it does, okay? And that's, in my mind, the critical, you put that issue, fiscal policy is way more important than monetary policy. So let's stop knee-jerk response, headline every three months, the Reserve Bank makes an announcement about the interest rate, because they have to make an announcement about the interest rate every six weeks, actually, which is a bit scary because it's not that important anymore. What's way more important is what government is going to do in terms of its taxing and its spending for the economic cycle, because monetary policy is now redundant. We've only got one tool back. We've actually got to bring back fiscal policy into the jargon of New Zealand economic management, which is going to be a bit scary for some of those economists who have been learnt who've been taught that government doesn't have a role to play. You know, it's only the markets that function. My worry, and in, indeed, it's almost a, a reflected in the response we had last week to the, the transport package, the Wellington transport package that was announced, and I sort of yawned a bit because we were promised this a little while ago, but lo and behold, we had headlines which say, Treasury advised against that because the business case hadn't been worked out, hadn't been issued in terms of this transport infrastructure spend. My response is, if we'd waited for the business case, we probably still wouldn't have built the Auckland Harbour Bridge. And I'm only semi-joking there. So how much effort do we have to do in terms of convincing people that a business case is actually very narrow, let's do the bleeding obvious. Sometimes it does take, and that's leadership, that's fiscal policy, that's government. Hand on heart, the country needs the spending, go out and do it. What was that? What was that election? Never mind, never mind. You know, I, I recall three words, but I can't quite remember them. Anyway, if you want to know how scary it is out there in the um, out there in the world at the moment is that quote from the IMF, which I'll just put in front of you. The main shared policy priority is for countries to resolve cooperatively and quickly their trade disagreements and resulting policy uncertainty, which is code, which is the IMF code for saying, please, Mr. President Trump and Mr. President of everything else, fix it and stop getting ourselves into a mess because there's sorts of things that are really quite scary when the two biggest economies in the world don't want to trade with each other. Um, New Zealand's gonna get hurt, not to mention a fair lot of other people. But that's the context. There's always been an excuse not to deliver. But this government's got to deliver next week. Uh, putting aside all of those ish other issues, Yes, I know this current minister likes to talk about a rainy day surplus. Um, I'll go into the, the go into the issues around the surplus in a second. But in my mind, a rainy day surplus is hopeless when a fair number of our people are already drowning. Uh, 
um, and I'll, so that rainy day surplus excuse is wearing a bit thin in my mind. There's the story about fiscal policy is now critical. What's that a picture of? That's a picture of the interest rate at which the government can borrow, the New Zealand government can borrow, and it's heading down. When the New Zealand government can borrow it, what is not much more than 2% per annum, um, I begin to question why we really are that worried about debt in this country. Um, we were promised transformation. Actually, the government's hoisted itself up on its own pedestal because it hasn't done anything to reduce our expectations about transformation. So I hold them to account. The wellbeing budget, can we afford it? Bluntly, there's a graph of the surplus projected in December last year in the budget policy statement and the half-year economic and fiscal update. And these documents are great. I know most people start at the front of documents. Whenever I get this document, I always go to the back because that's where all the important stuff is, okay? The numbers. And one of those numbers is graphed out there. You've got the government increasing its surplus over the next three, four years to a surplus of pretty close to $8 billion annual in the last year of that horizon. And that includes about $2.5 billion of new spend per year included in that forecast. Okay, So we've got in the kitty already $2.5 billion of new spend every year. And so there'll be some announcements already and indeed on the 30th of May, which will tell you how much of that two and a half billion will be spent. But actually, that's gonna give you eight billion surplus. So how much more can we do? Well, this scenario here gives you another 500 million a year. So that gives you $3 billion every year to do new stuff. Okay, let alone the stuff that we're already doing. And that still, to me, looks like a surplus. Okay, that's still, you know, four and a half billion. So it's not really, you know, we've still got that rainy day surplus. And actually, if you want to push the envelope even further, we could even go, you know, three billion dollars surplus every year. That's still quite a lot in the New Zealand context. That gives you three and a half billion new spend per year. And I know there's a whole lot of queues for spending, but that's quite a lot of elbow room. And even with that, a whole lot of numbers, sorry, but it's important. Even with that, there is not a problem with debt. Even with my optimistic three and a half billion new spend every year for the next three or four years, that's a picture of the debt that everybody worries about. Um, the blue line is what the Treasury are forecasting, okay? Which is down to 17.5% of GDP. The target is 20%. We've hit that target already, so why are we worried about it? My scenario, when you have $3.5 billion new spend every year, you still hit your 20% target by 2022, 23, which is actually not that far out. And I'll put this in context. This doesn't include the $40 billion that we've got squirreled away in the super fund, okay? You take, you add that onto this and our debt is actually or not our debt, the government's debt is actually pretty close to zero, okay? The top of that graph only gets to 23% of GDP. This is low by New Zealand historical standards. It is low by international standards. Debt in Germany, government debt in Germany, actually in other parts of the world, Australia even, that number is well over 50% of GDP. You know, it's off that scale, okay? So why, oh, why, oh, why do New Zealand economic and business commentators 
consistently point to this as an important number. Why, oh, why, oh, why has this allegedly transformational government bide that argument, bide that narrative, and tied themselves into a target of something that is actually economically meaning, meaningless? And actually, let's push it out a little bit of elbow room. And this is, the, this is the issue, or this is the number that I'll be looking at when I look at the numbers is just how much elbow room will the government, will this government use to push that target out just a little bit? Use some, for want of a better word, creative accounting if it really has to. It's met its own self-imposed responsibility rules already. Okay. Its responsibility rules was where the dot was. It's met them already by the blue line going under that dot. Okay? So it could actually just say, well, we've met the debt targets, now we're going to go spend because we have to. Why do we have to spend? I'll skip that slide, I'll leave some... Why do we have to spend the business case for transformation? Somebody earlier asked me something about the ageing population and superannuation problems. Somebody else asked me about capital gains tax. To me, those are side issues. We in New Zealand have a habit of worrying about stuff that really, really isn't that important, like government debt. I remember when I went to university, which was a few years ago, pretty close to 40 years ago now, four decades, was when I first heard the phrase climate change. And the esteemed professor at the time says, you know, it's going to be a problem, but we don't have to worry about it because we've probably got about four or five decades to adjust and transition and transform and get used to it and figure out how we're going to respond. Okay, well, we've used up four of those five decades. We've probably used up four and a half of those five decades already. It's about time we started transitioning, seriously, rather than getting in the queue and pleading a special case about how we can't transition and it's got to be somebody else that does it for us. Climate change, inequality. Amanda talked about social capital and and how embedded inequalities mean that trust in, trust in our institutions, the trust in our um, ability to uh, contribute, our license to operate as a business gets eroded away if embedded inequalities remain. Um, that's what economics is about. It's not about budget responsibility rules and it's not about finance. When we talk about we can't afford to address inequality, I say, can we afford not to from an economic perspective? Economics is about the people and about the communities, and it's about those well-beings. The third one, climate change, inequality, the third one, and it's related to inequality, is housing if there aren't seriously, seriously large dollars on housing in this budget. Um, gearing $2 billion a year in terms of Kiwi Build, I will admit, not, not a year, $2 billion kickstart for Kiwi Build is a big number, uh, but it's going to take time. Um, we're running out of time. Uh, Got a couple of other slides I do want to talk about. No, I won't talk about that. Won't talk, we're talking about climate change. That's my inequality argument. I'll leave it. I've got one more slide on this. This is the elephant in the room in New Zealand. People talk about inequality as somewhere far away. Amanda put up some charts about this, that spider chart about Māori. Uh, outcomes and Pacifica outcomes compared to the rest of the population. It's a, it is a burning platform for New Zealand. We ignore it at our peril. The graph there is a graph across the horizontal axis of the proportion of households. Um, on the vertical axis is the proportion of income or wealth that those households have. If we were reasonably close to equal as a society community, it would be a diagonal line, 45 degrees. 
the further away from that diagonal line you get, the further away from relative equality we get. The dashed line is the distribution of income in New Zealand, which some people like to talk about. I talk about that solid line, which is a distribution of wealth in New Zealand today. And if you look at it closely, you've got about, I think, about 90-odd percent of New Zealand owning 50% of their wealth, of the country's wealth. Turn that round the other way. You've got the top 10%, which includes me, hand up, owning half the country in terms of the wealth, and most of it's the housing. The problem with wealth is that that then embeds in future opportunities for next generations. If you're talking about burning platforms, you're talking about transformation. If we're going to be serious about transformation, people like me have got to hurt. All right? It's as simple as that. I don't want to be too offensive, but it may well be a fair few of this people in this room as well. That's what we've got to confront. I'll leave that with you. And thank you for your time here. Thank you for the Policy Observatory and for Julianne helping us put this together. I'll ask Nick and Amanda to come and join us and happy to open it up for a bit of a Q&A.